So uh, thank you everyone for joining us uh, for the second part of our presentation today given by uh, uh, the uh, leading uh, team members of uh, EnduroSAP. And uh, our speaker uh, for this session is uh, Vector uh, Danchev. He's the uh, Chief Technical Officer of uh, EnduroSAT, and he'll be sharing with us some of the uh, more uh, technological aspects of EnduroSAT's recent projects and activities. So, uh, Victor, it's all yours. So, uh, once again, thanks for the spot. I'll be very happy to talk to you a bit more today about uh, what we call the shared satellite service. And as the, as the presentation name um, suggests, uh, it's what we believe is the future for a more accessible and sustainable space. So you're going to find out about the whole concept about what we call the share set, how it works, why we think it's better or, or at least more suitable for some applications than the traditional satellite and, and how we're coming up with it. So um, ju just to start to kick this off, because you're all familiar with CubeSats, I just want to mention a few, a few of the use cases and a few of the typical missions that we see all the time. Uh, since we're in contact with a lot of organizations that want to fly to space, um, educational, uh, commercial, uh, so any kinds of mission types, uh, you would normally see maybe these five uh, types of use cases that people get really involved in. Uh, I'd say maybe one of the leading uh, ones is Earth observation. We have a lot of um, communications and IoT in orbit processing is getting famous in orbit demonstration and validation and obviously educational missions. That is a lot of those currently happening for universities. And if you look at what they normally do in terms of payloads, um, obviously in the Earth observation, you would be looking at camera or some other kind of a sensor. Yeah, in terms of in-orbit processing, they would be using some kind of on-orbit resources to actually do some uh, processing of this. Uh, we see a lot of SDRs coming up and we see a lot of communication systems for j not just for IoT, but also for dedicated point-to-point -point communication. Um, you can have, of course, for the IOD case, it's usually the payload itself is the mission, so you just need to verify it in space. And for educational, we've seen all kinds of, of possibilities in terms of payloads. But when you look at the duty cycles of how these things are used, you realize that in a lot of these missions, you have a huge amount of, of, of underuse of the nanosat. So, so just to give you a few examples, we've seen a lot of Earth observation, for example, missions that in many cases can have duty cycle less than a, than 60%. I mean, we've rarely seen something that has more than 60% just because of more or less what you have in terms of um, lighting conditions or what you have in terms of pointing accessibility. In terms of in-orbit processing, you can, you're even restricted a lot more normally. So uh, especially when it comes to some more uh, powerful applications like image processing, usually uh, you, you're quite aware uh, if you're looking at the market that onboard computers can very rarely deliver good quality of processing at, at, at a, a nice amount of power. I mean, usually either you're overheating your satellite or you don't have any processing. And, uh, and th this is the reason why a lot of this is happening at a very small fraction of the time. Uh, communications and, and uh, IoT in particular, it's usually restricted to certain zones. It's usually restricted to a few ground stations. So it's hard to get this to more than 10, 20 percent duty cycle and any kind of uh, automatic tracking it also falls under this so you, you you've heard i'm sure of um, adsb aas and similar they also fall under similar um, constraints although they may have a very large duty cycle but normally they don't really care about orientation they don't really care about uh, how you're pointed so they can um, and they have very low power and then, of course, for the IOD, IOV cases, it's really dependent on the type of payload. But a large amount of the payloads, they just want to show some work in space. They just want to see some degradation, but they don't necessarily look for a big duty cycle. So a lot of the times, they actually want less than 10% duty cycle. And of course, for the educational, depending on what you have, it could be a combination of everything above. It could be just one or a few of them. It could be an IOD by itself. So it can vary quite a bit. But something that, that we noticed um, designing and, and working with uh, with a lot of companies and universities for nanosats and, and at the current stage we as, as Rachel was mentioning to you uh, we have more than 100 clients and we've been in the business for quite a while um, something that we noticed is that uh, in a lot of the cases the satellite is really underused because uh, it's built entirely for one single payload and it's only built the whole mission concept it takes some small duty cycle and never really um, uh, ne never really tries to optimize for it. So there is just one payload. You have a very traditional space segment where you have an onboard computer that is connected to uh, to this payload and that is taking care of it. And if something happens to that onboard computer, if something happens to one of the critical systems you were mentioning, latch ups and EPS, for example, 
you you lose the mission very quickly and and this payload um, I mean you need to build a whole new mission for each one of the next ones so something that we came up with is something that is currently based uh, on our software defined uh, satellite architecture is something that we call a shared satellite and the reason why we came up with this and the reason why we started using it is because we saw a lot of customers that could, that really want to go to so, so when you go to these customers usually what you see is they want to go to space very quickly they want to go to space at, at no cost at all so if uh, it, it's always uh, can you get the larger discount can it be uh, cheaper obviously because they're all on on a on a funding and they all want to do more with less so uh, but but at the same time they have a very complex dedicated system that they're building themselves and that is really taking them a lot of effort uh, to get to space so they need a lot of expertise and you know in in the in the ideal equation of um, of projects you have uh, you have cost you have time and you have quality and you cannot move uh, all, all three of them uh, you know they're inter interdependent if you move one the other two are going to change so you have to choose which one so, so something that we came up with and something that we, you know, we were able to do and that we're testing and, uh, and actually in orbit validating now is what we call the shared sat concept so the whole idea is not to have to build a dedicated mission and not really have to go through this full process if you're uh, if you just want to fly your payload but to really assemble and very easily integrate the payloads on a very uh, very strictly defined bus that is so flexible that it can accommodate all of them all together and just to give you a little of the of the secret sauce if i can say it like this um, on the on how this looks as a, as an architecture and as a as a kind of uh, let's say not not complex but very high level um, connections in this in this satellite we have our default bus that consists of the power system the onboard computer the communication subsystems and the ADCS and this is fully integrated and ready and we actually pre-book missions with this so this this satellite which is already qualified and which is fully uh, capable of taking additional payloads on board it's simply interfaced with all the payloads that that we bring from the customer side and these payloads they get complete um, connection over uh, from any of these subsystems on the satellite and this is one of the big uh, i would call it revolutions or, or cha game changers in the whole concept is that as you can see on this very high level schematic um, all of the payloads are actually connected to any of the subsystems of course if the if the customer wants this if they don't we also have secondary interfaces where the payload can only be interfaced with the onboard computer but the key point here is that you have an incredible redundancy you have an incredible distributed system that literally the adcs or the uhf or any of these subsystems can actually take command and, and control uh, functionality in case of any problem with the onboard computer so in case of any uh, issue that you may have from your onboard computer and you can actually use the data processing capability of the whole platform so <clears throat> the whole concept is not to rely on a single point that uh, allocates everything else so usually what you have on the left here is what you have in the classical uh, space segment and what you have in, in most uh, missions so the onboard computer is interfaced to the payloads over some uh, over some um, uh, interfaces and then it's also controlling everything else and if you lose this onboard computer then then that's it what we do instead is that every each one of our subsystems can actually directly receive commands and can be directly operated from the ground so uh, absolutely uh, independent of the onboard computer and this can also happen with each of the payloads so each of these payloads uh, is, is also connected to each subsystem and of course we can also do the classical connection but the the whole reason for doing this is that it allows us to extend the lifetime of a satellite to a five-year design lifetime just because we have so much more resilience of course all of the main subsystems like the eps and like the communication they must be uh, additionally res resilient because without them it doesn't matter how much data handling you have but this allows us really to guarantee that data handling wise we have a complete control of the mission that is really really redundant uh, as compared to most classical missions now what do we fly with uh, this is this is just a, a quick overview of, 
uh, what we I mean I'm not I'm not going to make it into a commercial uh, presentation so I'm going to focus on on the characteristics and the, the kind of um, technology that we use for these shared submissions and why we do it um, and this is just some high level information once again so what we fly with this is our 6U platforms right now uh, that is it offers a lot of flexible interfaces so from 3.35 volt uh, configurable interfaces battery roll it can offer up to 125 megabits per second uh, downlink speed it always comes with an integrated ADCS that we integrate and provide in this way and and you can have quite a lot of mass so you can reach almost eight kilograms of available mass and about four units of four and a half units of volume for actually putting the payloads but the main innovation of the software defined platform it's something that we that we both um, deliver to customers separately and we use for the shared set and it's the enabler of the shared set is the fact that it has this distributed data handling and uh, an independent operational modes um, framework on, on top. So I cannot disclose too much about the operational modes. I would really love to, because it's something that is, is, is part of the reason why we can do the shared SAT. So how do we handle all of these payloads and how can we program the, the satellite uh, in this framework in order to allow their duty cycles not to conflict with each other? Uh, but unfortunately, that's something that we, that we normally share just with the technical documentation and um, and it's something that is, uh, I would say, too much of the secret sauce to to dive into. But I'd be happy to answer any questions. And the short answer is uh, that we that we make use of, of logic on board that detects any conflicts between these payloads and and resolves them based on the desired duty cycle of each and the priority. So um, so where we're going yeah, as soon as next year, and this is something that we're qualifying this year, is even bigger uh, CubeSat uh, because uh, surprisingly for us, the 6U uh, that we had, uh, e even the 6U that we had for next year are already getting uh, quite, uh, quite fast booked. So we're looking to, to extend the volume and the capability. And the, the thing that we're looking into is, is the 12U. And our 12 view is actually being qualified this year, and we're going to start flying it next year. But it's exactly the same architecture software-wise. It's exactly the same bonuses in terms of um, distributed uh, data handling. And one added, of course, value is uh, the higher volume and mass, and that we are reaching up to one gigabit uh, with this new architecture due to a much improved K-band radio on board. So, um, how does how does the whole concept work so i gave you more or less the outline why we do it because we see a lot of payloads with different duty cycles that usually underutilize the satellite how it works well we don't want the customer to have to to think of how to merge these we don't want customers to to worry about how they can combine these things and how they can make it work on the engineering level so what we do is we design everything we build the icd for all the payloads together so we uh, and, and we integrate them together. The only thing that we want from the customer, obviously, is to give us their payload, to select the flight that they wanna they wanna go to, and after uh, a preposterously low time that you're about to see, they can start getting their, their data directly in the cloud because we also support the ground operations. So we have our own ground station, and uh, the, the, the way forward is that there is no need at all to have ground infrastructure, uh, just a, uh, an account uh, at Endurosat which allows you to, uh, to, that, to get all your data e either in the browser or to an API. If I had to give you a brief summary of, um, I mean, of, of why, uh, what are the benefits of, of this ideal and, and of this uh, service that we're realizing as compared to what you've heard as hosted payloads, we are not really a hosted payload. The reason is that one of the main differences is that you really have control over your payload completely. So what I, what I mean by this is, first of all, you can directly send commands to the payload. This is uh, this is something that's more or less present in other in, in the hosted payload cases as well. But you can actually command the platform as well. So during the operation mode of your own payload, the platform pointing can be configured. The platform power and how much power you can get out of it uh, in, the, in the different channels this can be configured. So you can really tailor the platform and the satellite bus during your own payload operation. And the probably the biggest benefit is that you can really select how it's pointing, so you can even do precise target pointing on the ground. So if, especially for imaging or uh, or uh, communication, where you may need a redirective antenna, you can do this, and this can be set up completely in the logic of the operations. So the full platform uh, is is really becoming yours for the time of your payload's duty cycle, 
and then uh, becoming someone else's for the payload for another payload due to cycle. So it's, this is the big bonus as compared to simply hosting a payload. You don't really just share some space, you actually share the control of the satellite. And this is all provided through the same cloud segment, so you, you don't have to worry at all about any kind of ground infrastructure. Uh, we have our own 5-meter dish near Sofia, Bulgaria, that we use for the data downlink, and, and two more UHFs that we use for all the telemetry and telecommanding, and you literally get remote access to these. So your data, it immediately goes to the cloud whenever you, we have a downlink. Uh, all the data is distributed, it's parsed and uh, rerouted to the respective uh, customer uh, cloud accounts, and only you have the, uh, any access to it. So um, if you have five payloads on the same satellite, actually our, our pilot mission, we're testing with seven payloads on the same sat. Uh, after the downlink and after it gets processed in the cloud, only the respective customer of each one of these payloads gets the data that uh, that they have. And uh, and when I was mentioning about the preposterously low timing, uh, literally the the shortest time frame that we have is uh, six months. So that's literally uh, about six times less than you would normally have um, if you start planning your mission from scratch. Three years is probably the shortest that you can that you can have, and, uh, and and probably the shortest customer that we've had so far. Uh, was was around that time, so about 180 days, even a bit less, from the actual booking of the mission, uh, including the actual uh, assembly of the satellite. In that case, we had already assembled everything but their payload, the integration of their payload into it, which includes hardware and software integration, the actual qualification campaign, uh, the launch, and and literally in a month, they're, they're going to start getting their data because they're on this pilot mission that I was uh, mentioning uh, launching now. So, uh, of course, we don't recommend waiting for the last minute. So if, if this is something that sounds interesting uh, and, and the concept and the idea behind uh, is, is something that you, you want to learn more about, uh, don't, don't hesitate to contact me. You'll see some contacts in the end. Uh, but, but this is just to give you an idea of, of why it's enabled, because we register the whole satellite in advance. We have the whole system in advance that is flexible on the hardware, so we can accommodate all the necessary interfaces and all the software can be easily updated. And uh, and obviously because we have all of this in-house, so we can do all the qualification and testing, uh, first of all assembly, of course, and then the qualification and testing uh, on demand internally, of course, only limited by when the launch actually is. So why do we consider this to be a more sustainable and, and easier, uh, you know, just putting aside the whole uh, pricing and the whole ease, why do we consider this to be more sustainable? If you look at what's going on with nanosatellite launches, these are booming, and this is ju this is just an, uh, uh, an official report from nanosats.eu. Uh, for 2021, we have literally 700 or so planned, and we're seeing a huge increase. And this this increase, it's, it's nice on one side. I mean, there's a lot of uh, missions, there's a lot of know-how and a lot of business going on but on the other side when you when you come to think about the, the debris situation and the fact that we already have a huge amount of uh, space debris on our hands uh, this is also something that's very risky because if you uh, split for every each one of these payloads i was mentioning seven payloads now uh, as a baseline at least three to five payloads on a mission or so uh, if you split all of these into satellites you're literally getting each one of them uh, polluting the orbital space and increasing the risk of conjunctions and, and collisions. So we believe that this is one of the most sustainable ways of actually going to space because instead of focusing on I'm going to build more satellites because I can, you really focus on what you can do. So we want to build less satellites with more capability and with more value to the ground without having to move towards uh, a larger amount. And um, so I'm not going to, as I mentioned, I'm not going to turn this into any kind of commercial uh, presentation. On the website, you can see all the pricing and all the information on uh, if this sounds interesting to you also as a, as, as a service, apart from a concept. But to, to give you a short uh, summary of how this whole thing works, we literally have a single one-off fee that includes all the design, all the integration, all the legal aspects and the registration, the qualification of the satellite, and then the actual launch and commissioning. And after this, we simply have a service fee that is based on a yearly uh, fee, just just depending on the power you use and the data you use. So nothing else. And from this point on, uh, literally, you can have uh, six months from the from the booking to getting the first uh, payload in space, and then on a yearly uh, on, a, on a yearly basis, decide how much data you want, what kind of operations you want, 
even on our first missions, we already have customers that are planning to use completely different uh, or, or at least very different uh, mission scenario for the first year that they, that they fly and for the follow-up years, uh, especially those doing IOD, they have completely different ideas for the first few months as compared to the long-term testing of their payload. So this is all the flexibility that is provided and you can we can even update the whole uh, CONOPS and the whole uh, mission concept of operations on the run with this with the framework that I was mentioning. So just to give a brief summary uh, where we are right now and how we how we got here more or less. Um, I mean, right already mentioned to you the the, the early times, the difficult times from from an attic uh, to getting to, um, to, to to getting to a sustainable business. Uh, at this point on, uh, we actually are booking on every quarter. So this year we have our pilot mission that is called Spartan. And the name is, is actually something that's of an, an abbreviation, shared platform for applied research and technology affirmation. It's, it's, a, it's a bit long. Uh, we are actually launching this uh, literally in a month. So it was just delivered to the launch provider and uh, on the, officially at least on the, the 24th of June, we were expecting a launch uh, and, uh, and the, the verification of this first share set with seven payloads on board. We already have a fully booked mission for Q4 this year. So this is, for, this is gonna be launched in December uh, as a baseline and you can see some orbital details here. Uh, both of these are sun synchronous with different LTANs. Uh, and starting from next year, we have on every quarter, we actually have a mission so um, not too much info is known about the LTAN then, but these are all going to be sun synchronous as well. They're all going to be launched uh, by Falcon, so by Falcon 9. And we literally, for the first two of these missions, we already have more than 60% capacity. So we're, we're looking, uh, obviously, at uh, expanding the volume and, and potentially flying even a 12U in Q3 just because of this fact that in some of these cases, uh, operations-wise and uh, data handling-wise, we don't have an issue putting more payloads, but volume-wise, we're, we're reaching the limits. So that's why we're moving also towards the bigger platforms. And in all of these, the, the capability and uh, the availability is, is the same in terms of operations, in terms of pointing, and so on. So they all support all of these operations that I was just mentioning. Uh, and all of this is obviously also available on our website, so not, not to go too much in that direction, but you can actually log into the website, you can find out more information about them, and you can even ask a query, so you can even dis, um, check how much it would cost and what would be the, the timeline for a specific payload. You can select the mission and you can give us some info in terms of the volume, in terms of the mass of this payload, and we can contact you for, for some more details on the data handling side afterwards. So where, where are we going from here? Um, it's, as, as I was mentioning, when Spartan was uh, fully qualified and was delivered. So this is actually an image from the, from the TVAC testing of the, of the satellite. Um, and now we're expecting it to, to lead the way uh, of the service and of the, of the 6U platforms that we provide in, uh, at the end of, um, of June. And, uh, and from this point on, as I was mentioning, 2022, every quarter looking at launch and 2023, we're looking to even double this. So literally every four, five, 45 days to have a slot available in the space. And why do we do this? Again, because it, um, it allows us and it, it allows uh, customers from all around the world, not just commercial players, but universities and especially education to get to space at a fraction of the cost, much faster without any kind of complexity and to focus only on the payload. So only on what they want to do and not uh, on any complexity of the satellite itself. So that's, that's more or less the summary from my side. Um, and you can all find me, so I'm going to stay and I think it's, it's better to, to do a Q&A that can answer a bit more of the questions because I'm not sure to what detail uh, I should uh, speak about any of these points. Um, so I'm, uh, I remain available to discuss uh, as a Q&A and then if you, for some reason, if you are unable to stay or you forget to ask something, you can also write to me. Uh, the email is listed here so you can write back to me and if you're interested in uh, flying either uh, commercially or learning more about the service and, um, and understanding about the platforms and the architecture aspects, uh, please contact me and uh, don't hesitate to do so. Okay, thank you very much, Victor. Um... So uh, now that we can open it up for questions, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, either speak up or raise your hand or type your question in the chat. So the architecture of, this, of Spartan looks uh, quite interesting. If I understand correctly, 
essentially every single subsystem is can essentially substitute for the uh, OBC. Is that correct? Yep, exactly. So essentially, so, every subsystem has a essentially an OBC it's, uh, by itself. Yeah, essentially that's that's the that's the point. Of course, they vary in terms of uh, in terms of power and in terms of, um, of, of I mean in terms of computing power in terms of what they can do. But yes, each one of them can can take data handling capabilities. Okay. So I, I would imagine this adds uh, some level of overhead to the overall power budget of the spacecraft. Actually, no. Uh, this is this is a good point. Um, it does not. Uh, the simple reason is because uh, apart from the main onboard computer, uh, which is used for handling anything from the from the payloads nominally, the rest of them they're they're much lower power and much higher efficiency microcontrollers. So they they are they cannot match the same that the main onboard computer has. But together, they can actually deliver all of the data handling functionalities in case of problems here. Of course, they don't deliver the same. Okay. Is this trans would this transition occur autonomously on orbit? For example, say for some yep. reason. Okay. Yeah, exactly. So, so this is this is all part of these operational modes that I was mentioning. They're also distributed, so they're not happening only in the onboard computer, but they're distributed above uh, about all of these. Uh, but un unfortunately, I can't dive into too much detail in them. Understandable. Um, still, it's a very interesting uh, concept. So um, if I understand correctly regarding the service that you're offering, you would have multiple payloads from different users, and then um, each user would essentially have a particular uh, time slot during which they could operate the spacecraft to their liking. So it's not exactly a time slot. Mm -hmm. uh, these, these are not fixed in some periodic way. Uh, they're chosen based on the, the duty cycle and the requirements in terms of pointing and power. So you can even have some of these working together. And I give you an example, which is actually um, from our December mission. I give you an example where you would have um, two processes, so two in-orbit processing uh, things happening in conjunction with Earth observation. So the, the satellite would be pointing the camera to the target. Uh, and there would be another payload, so another customer's uh, payload, which is an onboarding processing that is going to be happening at the same time because they're not conflicting in any way. So the power-wise and pointing-wise, this one doesn't care about pointing, this one cares. So we are in this one's pointing mode, but both of them are operating. So you can you have things like this, and especially when it comes to communications, uh, what, if you have omnidirectional uh, type of uh, payload, it, this can happen in conjunction with, with all of the other uh, two. So you can have more, more than one payload working together. And uh, if I understand correctly, the customer would be able to specify the types of actions that would be taking place, but the actual yep. uh, commanding and operations would be handled by Indrosat? Yes, so so the, the, the customer defines the mode of operation. Uh, so to, 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 to give you a brief summary, the customer defines what their payload needs to be pointing at. So basically the, the, the pointing DCM or any other parameterization that the payload needs. Uh, this can be updated by the customer so they can queue up commands and they can actually command the payload themselves. So they, um, it, it's not Endurusa that, um, that is commanding the satellite manually. The customer can queue a command for their payload that changes the parameters of this mode that we have agreed upon. So for example, they can change the target of the camera and on the next possible pass, this is going to be uplinked and it's going to be modified. Okay. I assume there's some type of, we'd be performing any types of simulations or sanity checks, you know, just to make sure that what the customers are uh, are requesting taken together, it, you know, will uh, is actually feasible and will not uh, threaten the integrity. Yeah, system. yeah. Absolutely. So, so this is actually part of this uh, part of this one of the uh, one of the things that it includes is actually hardware in the loop testing. So, in the final stages before delivery, and this is before we do the launch review with all the customers, we actually do this kind of system level testing where we check that each of the operational modes complies with what we expect. So, so this is this is part of a simulation framework where the actual flight model is wired to, and it allows us to evaluate these things. So the customer would essentially provide the payload, um, a concept of operations, and an ICD, is that correct? Yep, exactly. An ICD to their own payload, and we would be translating this to the full platform. With respect to your customers, have any of them, uh, in your experience, uh, requested, for example, uh, insurance um, in the event of some uh, unforeseen uh, calamity? 
So, so this is actually one thing that may uh, that may not be listed here, but this is actually one thing that is always included. So mm -hmm. something that I might have missed to mention. So the full platform, it's always insured. And if we have any kind of launch problems, if we have a launch failure, uh, you know, uh, for some reason an orbit which uh, we cannot uh, do our mission in and so on, the whole platform is insured against this. And the customers have the option of either uh, flying uh, an equivalent payload or just getting their, their appropriate reimbursement. Okay. So this is this is always part of the of the deal, so to say. It's interesting from uh, uh, for us to hear uh, the uh, the uh, commercial perspective because uh, most of our presentations tend to be mainly t on the technical side. So, uh, are there any questions from uh, the audience? Uh, please feel free to type them or uh, go ahead and speak up. So, uh, if I may ask, I, I know you probably can't go into too much detail here, but. Are your customers for the service primarily academic or commercial or otherwise? So far, they're mostly commercial, mm -hmm. uh, but we have seen all, all kinds. So I think it's it's maybe 80 by 20% split mm -hmm. right now. OK. And uh, what do you view as being, so uh, it's an interesting idea of the entire software-defined platform. In, in, uh, in your view, uh, what do you think are some of the uh, directions that the uh, small satellite industry will be uh, heading in the future? Because uh, as we know, there are more and more players in this field. So w one thing that we believe is that definitely um, we would be seeing a lot more reconfigurable uh, missions, so a lot more reconfig reconfigurable satellites and uh, and really adaptability not not to use the small satellites as we use classical satellites. I mean, I've seen a lot of the times um, people try to make small sat and, and especially uh, even nanosat to make it work like a more classical satellite and to, to request some kind of resilience and redundancy and uh, I mean on, on, a, on a subsystem level that you would only see in a big geo satellite and this is something that um, I mean the whole concept of the nanosat world is, is completely different they're used for different things they're good for different things so uh, I think that this this kind of mapping should not be done like that and the way forward is is basically to find the niche in which these satellites work well and to use them by their uh, you know to their advantage and not to try to mimic something big with them okay so so i think that i think that we have a lot of realizations happening on this and and a lot of the smaller um, companies and universities are leading the way in this uh, so i think think we're going to see some interesting innovation in this regard mm -hmm. okay uh, we have a question from Warren Sue. Uh, since you will have several customers likely with different mission requirements that could be conflicting to each other, how do you intend to accommodate them all? So um, keep in mind that on the on the mission level, uh, things like the orbit and things like the so definitely things like the orbit they're already fixed. So all of these customers in advance they should have complied to what we have as an orbit. So they would know. Uh, what they're going to get in terms of passes, um, they would know what, and this is something that we deliver to them in analysis, so they would know what they're going to get in terms of um, communication windows, in terms of visibility, availability of certain zones, and so on. So anything that is dependent on, on the orbit, for example, it would be uh, fixed in advance, so the customers agree to this and we are, are already okay with it. Then when it comes to the actual operations, as I was mentioning, we don't really uh, have free for all on these missions. So since we have so many and uh, literally every quarter starting from next year, in case two payloads are really conflicting with each other and really not allowing each other to work, we would of course always split them in two consequent launches. The good news is that they're so close apart and starting from 2022 would be literally 40 days of, uh, apart so that it's it's not really any burden on any of the customers uh, to do this. I mean, normally, uh, normally, when you speak when you speak in the sector, especially the first customers to the service uh, for Q2 and Q4 uh, this year, some of them were, were actually very skeptical because of the low times, so the short time to, to flight, and they, they they were literally looking at us and some of the um, technical discussions suspiciously, like uh, it's uh, uh, guys, you're joking here, right? So it's uh, it's it's something that's just so uh, new in a way, and. Um, and not everyone can can fully uh, enter into it, but we already have some very interesting use cases where we we saw the merit uh, with the customers. Do you uh, have any um, requirements or specifications that are imposed uh, uh, that the payload users have to uh, comply with? For example, in terms of interfaces, mass, volume, or so yeah. forth. 
Yeah, so the, the two main ones are, of course, the qualification campaign. So we don't have a strict requirement for the, for the payload, uh, for the customers to, to qualify, but uh, we, they know the levels that we qualify on. So we do full vibrational uh, TVAC uh, and uh, yeah, so vibrational TVAC mostly, so shock, uh, random vibration uh, and TVAC. And they have the levels, so they must comply to these levels. Uh, we don't request from them any kind of certification officially, but we want them to to have uh, you know, good good knowledge that their payload is not going to have any issues, and this is their responsibility, and it remains in this way. Uh, and apart from this, uh, we don't have any strict requirements on the interface. So for this architecture to be to be working, we have a primary interface in the platform. Uh, that if they comply to it, we can interface them in exactly in this way. Uh, and this is, this is again something that's a bit more on the technical uh, details of the platform. It's, uh, I can disclose the actual interface, it's, it's over RS485, but we also support all primary secondary interfaces that you can see in the sector. And, uh, and that's literally uh, UART, I2C, SPI, um, name it, uh, CAM, anything that uh, as a secondary interface can be directly connected to the onboard computer. So uh, as long as the customer has any of these uh, and they uh, in advance give us the, the understanding of their protocol and how they want to be interfaced, we don't have any restrictions there. Uh, so this may only affect the, the lead time and, uh, mm -hmm. and the, the pricing in the end. Do you uh, work with the customer on um, payload development, for example, uh, do you provide feedback in terms of potentially potential modifications that might be necessary in terms of interfaces? Yes, so this is this is something that we that we do quite often, especially when it comes to mechanical interfacing and when it comes to any hardware adaptation, we provide this and it's included as part of the service. So in some cases, customers that don't want to, uh, especially customers that are not PC one hundred four compliant, we have already included this as part of the service. Um, you know, some kind of an adaptation board and mechanical board that allows them to to interface to what we have inside a satellite. Okay. We have another question. Uh, do you have any suggestions or ideas for cooperation amongst um, different uh, ground stations uh, internationally, such as information exchange or uh, or uh, shared use? Yeah. So, so this is something that we have already seen. I mean, there's there's a few companies that act like aggregators uh, to ground stations. So it's something that we have uh, seen uh, already. Uh, Personally, we don't really focus on this, so we use such services on the ground station whenever it's necessary, but it's not a main, um, I would say, use case for us and a main application for us. So uh, so I understand you have uh, your own ground stations in, uh, in Bulgaria. Do you also uh, make use yes. of some international services to, for example, rent time? On yes. Yeah, so, so on occasion, this is something that we can include uh, if there is a big demand for downlink or a very short revisit time requirement. Uh, to be honest with you, so far, uh, this the, the, because of the kind of speed that we can achieve, I mean, right now it's 125 megabits per second. And because with all of these shared sub um, orbits, we, we have on, on average, we have at least four passes per day with our own ground station. So far, we've not meta scenario for the next three missions at least that would require us to to contract additional stations but we are fully compliant with some of the big networks and uh, and that allows us if, if we want to use them especially in sso case uh, you know the, the the ones that have polar stations uh, they they can really uh, give you 15 passes per day so we can increase this quite significantly okay thank you very much and uh so uh, again if i understand correctly the spacecraft will be uh completely qualified once everything is integrated and subject to the same uh, environmental testing. Yeah, so, so the, the actual bus itself, it has, uh, it has been qualified even before this, but mm -hmm. we do of, uh, an acceptance testing uh, on the acceptance levels for every single uh, unit. So it's, it's a protoflight uh, methodology qualification uh, with the customer payloads. So every single unit is also undergoing uh, testing uh, on, the, on the environmental. Mm -hmm. Uh, so, uh, in the events, for example, uh, there is a payload failure during testing. Then, what would sort of be the uh, the uh, the way you would handle this? So, this is this is something that I mentioned. So, this this is something that we consider a responsibility of the customer. 
So uh, we during the testing, we want assurance from the customer that they understand the levels and their payload is built according to these levels. So if there is a payload fest, um, failure at this time, we would give them the chance to replace that payload, but it, it, it would not be in any way reimbursed uh, mm -hmm. by us because this is something expected from day one to be tested on. Okay, we have a question. Uh, can you elaborate on your facility's EMI tests? EMI tests, okay. Uh, so, so far, uh, a big part of the EMI has been focused on the inhibition uh, strategy, so just for the EPS. Uh, regarding any kind of uh, payload-specific EMIs, we have access to anechoic chambers and, and to, uh, so depending on which range you're interested in, usually it's below 1 gigahertz that the main interest is. We can actually measure from the usually EPS and other systems that have uh, converters uh, we can measure any kind of noise floor. Uh, what we what we've characterized is the whole noise floor for the full platform. So for customers that don't really have a big requirement on on some very 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 no, low noise floor, we just give them at the signature and at the start of the project, we just give them the noise floor that we have for the whole platform, and they determine whether they want some additional tests. If they need some additional tests, then we can provide this, of course. Okay, thanks. Uh, are there any additional questions to, uh, for Victor? Okay, um, it looks like that's about it in terms of questions. So uh, thank you very much, Victor, for taking the time to share uh, information about this uh, very interesting new platform. It's uh, very, uh, yeah, it's actually uh, very uh, interesting to see uh, new changes to the traditional uh, spacecraft system. And uh, thank you very much for sharing that with us. And uh, we'll definitely, again, uh, to the members of the audience, if you have any additional questions, please feel free to contact Victor. Yep. Thank you, Lauren. Thanks for the invitation. And I hope that we're going to see some of you uh, flying with us in the future. And of course, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of luck with your uh, missions, with your upcoming missions. Looking forward to hearing more about them as well. Thank you very much. And uh, I'm, of course, I'm sure we'll all be happy to share lessons learned. So thank you very much. Please say hi to everyone for me. And uh, stay healthy. Take care. Thank you. Take care. Bye-bye.